In today's lecture, we're going to talk about three genera of pathogenic yeast, the host-associated Candida and Malassezia, and the environmentally acquired Cryptococcus. All of these organisms are biocontainment level two. In the lab, Candida grows as a budding yeast, and if we incubate that pure culture in serum for two hours, what we get are the growth of germ tubes, which you can see in the background image here, these long structures emanating out from the yeast. Cryptococcus species produce a very characteristic large mucopolysaccharide capsule, which is antiphagocytic and immunosuppressive and makes them easy to identify, while Malassezia are bottle-shaped cells. Malassezia pachydermatis was first isolated from an Indian rhinoceros with exfoliative dermatitis back in 1925, and is our most commonly encountered species in veterinary medicine. Malassezia furfur complex, um, which causes infections in people, fluoresces brick red under UV light. In these images here, you can see Candida albicans. On the left, we have colonies of pure cultures with this very typical creamy yeast-like appearance. And on the right, we have uh, budding yeasts with, again, some of these germ tubes forming. In this image here, you can see bottle-shaped Malassezia pachydermatis organisms on cytological examination of an ear swab from a dog. And just to point out where the yeasts are, you can see here outlined in red, these bottle-shaped or uh, bowling pin-shaped uh, structures. Here we have cryptococcus species um, that have been stained actually with gram stain. Um, yeasts lack a peptidoglycan-based cell wall, so we don't describe them as gram-positive or gram-negative. That's just how this particular slide was visualized. In this picture, we have a much more characteristic view of cryptococcus. Um, so this culture was stained with India ink, and what I think you can appreciate is this large capsule surrounding the cell. So we have our yeast organism in the center, and this large mucopolysaccharide capsule all around it that excludes the dye. Both Candida and Malassezia are host-associated organisms, and infections with Candida are often caused by one's own resident strains. Malassezia pachydermatis is found on the skin of mammals and birds, and it tends to be localized to anatomical sites where we have a lot of sebaceous glands, so the anus, ears, lips, and interdigital skin. Cryptococcus species are found in the environment. So Cryptococcus gadii is associated with trees and soil, while Cryptococcus neoformans is found in sites contaminated with the droppings of pigeons. Interestingly, uh, melanized Cryptococcus, so strains producing these dark pigments, have actually been identified at the Chernobyl nuclear site utilizing ionizing radiation as a source of energy. So they have a very diverse uh, set of environments that they're able to live and grow under. Candida is a member of the Ascomycota phylum, which is actually the same group of organisms that we find brewer's yeast in. Within the genus Cryptococcus, we're primarily concerned with Gadii and Neoformans. And then both our Cryptococcus and Malassezia genera are members of the Bastidiomycota phylum, which also includes mushrooms, so chanterelles, and puffballs, like you can see in the background image here. Candida infections tend to be superficial, um, particularly in our veterinary species. So in birds, we see crop mycosis or thrush. In horses, we can see uh, oral infections and also infections of the gastric mucosa. In people, both superficial and systemic infections are recognized, with thrush and vulvovaginal candidiasis being most common, and invasive candidiasis increasingly recognized and increasingly encountered in severely compromised patients. Malassezia pachydermatis um, is most commonly seen in dogs and most commonly as a cause of otitis and dermatitis. Cryptococcus gadii causes systemic mycoses in cats. It's actually the most common agent of systemic mycoses in our feline patients. And we see it presenting most commonly as nasal granulomas. In humans and koalas, Cryptococcus gadii can also cause respiratory tract infections. Cryptococcus neoformans tends to affect individuals who have an immunosuppressive condition. 
Um, we see respiratory and central nervous system infections, and it tends to be an AIDS-associated disease. We're going to start with candida albicans and crop infections in birds. So birds are particularly susceptible to this oral and also crop candidiasis. Um, candida, like I said, most commonly causes infections on the mucous membranes where it's normally found. Young birds are most susceptible. And we can see outbreaks of disease affecting large proportions of the flock following some sort of intervention. So perhaps as a sequelae to coccidiostat treatment. So drugs which are given to control a parasite may impact the normal microbial communities on the mucous membranes, sort of providing an ecological niche for the candida to thrive and grow more than it normally would. These infections can be seen in both agricultural birds and pet bird species. On the right, we have a gross pathological image of a crop which has been opened up. And I think what you can appreciate are these sort of white proliferative lesions all over the mucosal surface. These proliferations are really characteristic of uh, candida infections in birds. In affected animals, clinical signs tend to be nonspecific. So the chicks may not grow, they might be listless, um, or the clinical signs can actually be masked by whatever the predisposing disease is. So these oftentimes occur when we have a good reason to get sick, and whatever that initial reason is may be sort of more clinically evident than the candida itself. Gross lesions are characterized by raised focal thickenings in the mucosa of the gastrointestinal tract. And here we can see another image of a crop. So here we have uh, focally extensive hyperkeratotic and necrotizing ingluvitis, which is the term we use to describe inflammation of the crop due to candida albicans. Treatment of these infections really depends on how many birds are affected, um, possible to treat them uh, by feeding nystatin, or to treat individual birds topically. There can be an association of crop thrush with hypovitaminosis A, which leads to squamous metaplasia. And so management factors, including ensuring that the birds have an adequate balanced diet is really important. Also controlling other concurrent diseases, potential immunosuppressive conditions, uh, perhaps dipping eggs in disinfectant, although this is controversial, we affect the cuticles surrounding that egg and potentially open up other problems. And then finally, in an agricultural setting, segregating affected birds to prevent cannibalism. We can see thrush in other species as well. Um, in horses, we see superficial infections most commonly. So thrush actually refers to candida infections on the mucous membranes. And what you can see here is lingual candidiasis on a horse tongue. Um, so we have these raised sort of proliferative plaques associated uh, with the infection. Systemic candidiasis can also occur. This is opportunistic and something that we'll see in animals who are immunosuppressed, whether it's a horse, a dog, or any other species. And in these cases, the organism can be found in the blood, respiratory tract, joints, urine. In people, three syndromes are associated with candida infections. First, oropharyngeal candidiasis, where we see white plaques on the tongue and pharynx, as you can see in this patient here. This is common in infants and adults who have immunosuppressive conditions, although it's rarely seen in otherwise healthy adults. Oropharyngeal candidiasis is actually an AIDS-defining condition and is also seen in people being treated for cancer. Uh, this particular image taken from the Centers for Disease Control is of an AIDS patient, um, and this particular round of infection was uh, successfully treated with fluconazole therapy. We can also see genital or vulvovaginal candidiasis. Um, this is a very, very common infection, which infects approximately 75% of adult women at some point in their lifetime. So a large proportion of the population um, is affected. In women, we typically see uh, vulvopruritis, burning, and potentially discharge. We can also get genital infections in men, which manifests as a pruritic penile rash, Risk factors for infection include pregnancy, diabetes, long-term broad-spectrum antimicrobials or corticosteroids, so therapies which are going to cause great perturbations to either the normal microbial communities of the uh, genital tract or suppress the immune system. Interestingly, wearing cotton underwear has been shown to actually reduce the risks of infection. 
And finally, we can also see invasive disease. So candidemia, or candida in the bloodstream, is increasingly encountered in hospitalized patients. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control estimates that there are 25,000 cases annually in that country, with an estimated mortality rate of 19 to 24%. So there is a large burden of mortality in patients who get these infections. However, the cost goes beyond just the human cost. Um, these patients are hospitalized longer, so 3 to 13 more days in hospital, and 6 to 29,000 in excess medical costs, excess healthcare costs. So there's a, a big infrastructure burden and financial burden also associated with invasive candidiasis. Mm -hmm.